So, good afternoon, and I'm very happy that you all made it for this concluding open panel of the seminar on 20 years tampere, which we have organized with the Finnish presidency of the Euro EU Council. I have to watch out what I say, the EU Council, not the European Council. All these things are so extremely important. But it was really a pleasure. We had basically, first one and a half days, a closed seminar, which was directed by my colleague Sergio, and now we'll try to open it up in a debate. Um, I said yesterday when opening this, how important this process has become, and that's what we heard, for example, yesterday in the ensuing panel. If you remember about, I mean, temper stems from the Amsterdam Treaty, which was 1997, if I remember correctly. Temper was the first European Council which started implementing what was agreed in the Amsterdam Treaty, which basically gave more powers to the EU in the domain of JHA. So we commemorate these 20 years of that council, which was a very significant council in that domain. And if I recall the words, I think it was from Andrew Jeddes yesterday who said that if you or somebody else in the panel, if you just remember that at that time, the EU budget for these matters was about 30 million. Now in the next MFF, it will be three to four billion just to give you an idea of how important this issue has become. <coughs> I think also we have seen in the context, obviously, of Brexit, how important this issue of citizenship and this common space of security and uh, freedom is and what it means. Say many citizens, I think the large majority in Europe certainly does not sufficiently realize that there is something like a European citizenship. And I think, uh, sorry to say, thanks to Brexit, I think some at least have started to realize what it means. We do not only have national rights, we have also European rights. And that, I think, is an extremely important achievement of what we've seen um, from this process, which was initiated at the Tampere European Council. And I'm extremely happy that we can have the seminar at that occasion today, and that we have also been... Uh, able to work with the Finnish presidency at that occasion. Um, also, yeah, what a coincidence, 20 years later, the Finns have again the presidency. So it, it was planned, I think, at the time. Um, you see, the council did its work very well, um, just to make sure that the Finns would have, have again the presidency and to celebrate this. Of course, there's another celebration because it's the 10 years of the Lisbon process as well. Um, the Lisbonization, uh, the word which I read yesterday, I wasn't even aware, about, uh, aware of that word. But the Lisbon IJs, which made it uh, this abbreviation, the area of freedom, security, and, and justice, rather than the JHA, which we mostly use. So it's 10 years. And then, of course, we now have yeah, today or at around these moments the start of a new process, which is the new commission, the new parliament. And we've seen how important these issues are already on the agenda for the von der Leyen Commission, as well in her opening words, which she said in, in July as well as in the hearings which are ongoing and in the letters, the mission letters to the new commissioners, 
and the debate which there is in the European Parliament around these issues, rule of law, European way of life, European values, etc. So really, I'm happy that we can do this, and I'm also very proud that um, as CEO of SEPS that we can do so much work on this. Thanks to Sergio and his entire team, because I often say on this issue, which is a very specific technical issue, we have a team of about five, six people, which are all PhDs in law, um, SEFs mostly work, used to work with political scientists, economists in this area. It's mostly an area for uh, lawyers. We didn't have lawyers, and now we have this whole team, which helps us also sometimes on other issues as well. If we have a problem like a copyright issue or so, they can uh, give us always good, good advice. But it's great that we have such a team in house, and I think I can say we are proud to be the only think tank to have such a strong team to work on these matters, and we are consulted often, very often almost all the time on these matters, doing a lot of work for not only the Commission, also the European Parliament, for other European bodies like the Court of Auditors, or even national institutions, and working also in the context of age 2020 programs and others on these matters. I think there is still a lot of work to be done. I think it's probably only the beginning. If I say that the budget for the next MFF is three to four billion, in 20 years I think we'll have a budget of much more, because there will be much more demand from citizens. You can be sure to have this area of justice, security, and uh, freedom. And with this, I want to give the word to Andrew, because Andrew will have to leave then a bit earlier, because he has to catch his train. And I will introduce the, you then in a moment. Andrew. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be very brief, but I just wanted, I'm, I'm here representing the European University Institute in Florence, where I'm the director of the Migration Policy Center. Uh, and we've, we've cooperated with SEPS on this event, and we are cooperating more extensively with SEPS. It's a very important cooperation for us at EUI. Uh, just for those of you who aren't aware of EUI, uh, we, we're, we're uh, been established for over since the early 1970s. We offer PhD training and postdoctoral training. And from next year, the EUI will also establish a School of Transnational Governance based in Florence offering master's training and high-level professional training. And on that, we will also be collaborating, I think, with SEPS as well. So our working relationship with SEPS will develop, and our research, our fundamental research at the European University Institute for more than tw uh, 20 years has had a very strong focus on the development of the uh, justice and home affairs, the area of freedom, justice, and security, and it will remain central to our work in the future. So this meeting uh, yesterday and today has been incredibly valuable uh, and this will be an agenda that will continue we're very very happy to be associated with it and very honored to be able to participate in this event and support it i'd like to thank everybody who's participated for their contributions thank you thank you andrew and of course we're happy to cooperate with eui as, as i said sometimes you pick our brains because i know uh, sergio is teaching at the eui but this is the kind of cooperation which we want of course and, and thank you for your uh, also uh, involvement yesterday. So let me again give the floor to our keynote speaker of today, uh, Malin Brankar from the State Secretary from the Ministry of Justice in Finland. I'm extremely happy that you made it, that you came over especially, and that you will you now set the team as how you see it from your perspective, not only I think from the temperate perspective, but much more looking forward, uh, what it means for the years to come, uh, probably a tripling of the budget, as I said, and, and 20 years from now, and let's say even much more work for you. Malin. You can stand up as you wish, uh, or you can, yeah, okay. Dear guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to be here today with you as the keynote speaker of this session. 20 years ago, Finland, back then a relatively new member of the European Union, was for the first time holding the presidency of the EU. At the time, the European integration had reached a new stage and the Tampere European Council held an important meeting in which groundbreaking decisions was taken. This decision profoundly changed the European Union and created a union of freedom, security, and justice.
today, the Finnish EU presidency coincides with the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the Tampere milestones. Since the very beginning, it was clear that the European area of freedom, security and justice could only be built due to and on basis of a shared commitment to human rights, democracy and the rule of law. Furthermore, this is the basis for any future development of the EU justice and home affairs. After Tampere, justice and home affairs soon became the fastest developing policy field within the Union. And fundamental rights, stable in institutions, and well-functioning justice systems became more and more important during any ongoing accession process. For two decades now, the area of freedom, security and justice has been built with remarkable achievements. At the same time, the union has expanded uh, by the way of the accession of new member states. And in the multi-annual programs of Tampere, the Hague and the Stockholm, the European Council took further steps uh, within the field of justice and home affairs. Once again, we are at the crossroad and I thank SEPS and other organizers for taking this opportunity to jointly discuss new milestones and paths to follow. The Finnish EU presidency now collides with a new institutional setup. We have decided to use this opportunity to invite EU justice and home affairs ministers to identify and explore key issues for future developments based on the new strategic agenda adopted by the U June European Council. The new European Parliament has started its work and the President-elect of the new Commission has published her political guidelines for the future. My intention today is to approach the future from the perspective of common European values. For the development of the justice and home affairs, a strong foundation of our common values is perhaps more important today than ever before. Therefore, the first priority of the Finnish presidency is to strengthen the toolbox that contributes to strengthening the protection of fundamental rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Looking at the new strategic agenda and the political guidelines of Ms. Ursula von der Leyen, it seems clear that European leaders have recognized the particular importance of our core values. Common values are the basis for mutual trust and confidence between member states and the European cooperation in the field of justice and home affairs. The Tampere European Council endorsed the principle of mutual recognition to become the cornerstone of judicial cooperation. This means that our focus has been and still is on a smooth, direct, and effective cooperation between authorities of different member states. There is no need for cross-checking human rights compliance due to the fact that we have trust. In order to strengthen trust further, the EU legislators have for the past 10 years established an impressive set of common minimum standards 
for criminal procedural rights. This has truly been a remarkable achievement. Even though I now have concentrated mainly on the area of justice and criminal law, mostly due to my professional background, the importance as well as the effects of mutual trust and common values goes far beyond. Mutual confidence and the presumption of compliance by other member states with EU law and fundamental rights has been at the core of all efforts to build a common European asylum system. In the same vein, looking at civil law, over the years the EU has taken decisive steps towards abolishing the executor, thus abolishing barriers of mutual recognition. In recent years, on a number of occasions, the European Court of Justice has been asked to interpret the boundaries of mutual confidence and mutual recognition. For the future development of the area of freedom, security, and justice, it's crucial that the balance is maintained. And the court has repeatedly confirmed that the rebuttal of principle of mutual trust should only occur in exceptional circumstances. In reality, today, mutual trust between member states has been challenged in many ways. In the area of justice, the court has identified important issues that entail the potential to challenge mutual trust and mutual recognition. We have to keep a close eye on these warning signs. For instance, poor prison conditions can become an obstacle of mutual recognition. And thus, we can cooperation between member states. During the Finnish presidency, discussions have continued on ways to tackle the problem. The EU can be an important forum for sharing best practices in this field, both as regards to detention as well as to their alternatives. The Presidency's initiative has received a positive response in the Council, and there seems to be a genuine support within the Member States to further discuss about the increased use of alternative measures. One important manifestation of our common values is the Charter of Fundamental Rights. The Charter influence has been significant in the field of justice and home affairs, as you all know. And the evolving case law of the Court of Justice has been of great relevance to further developments. For instance, as regards any initiative affecting everyone's right to the protection of personal data. The rapid development of digital innovations have largely reshaped our society and economies in the 21st century. And we have all the reasons to believe that the said development will continue. At the same time, this evolution has created new legal issues relating to the processing of our personal data. The Court of Justice has tackled these questions in a number of landmark cases, many of which are now reflected in the EU's recently modernized legal framework on data protection. Particularly in the field of freedom, security and justice, we need better understanding of both the advantages as well as the challenges 
that come with digitalization. For instance, we need to take into account artificial intelligence and other automations when planning the future. Furthermore, we need to take into account digitalization as a whole with all of its manifestations. For example, in relations to new technologies, 5G networks and hybrid threats. We need to consider how we can most effectively utilize digitalization and respond to the challenges that arise with it, while at the same time maintaining our common values. The charter is not only important as an expression of our common values. It also confirms the commitment of the EU to uphold these values. The Charter needs to be effectively implemented to all Europeans so that all Europeans can fully enjoy their rights. Therefore, more work needs to be done to give the Charter greater visibility and to en enhance its active use and applica application also on the national level. This also is a topic of our presidency. And it's on the agenda of the EU Justice Ministers meeting next Monday in Luxembourg. And I would like to stress that we also consider it very important that the work towards the EU accession to the European Convention on Human Rights continues. All in all, it can be said that the protection of our common values means the protection of the system of mutual recognition within the EU. At the core of our common value base is the rule of law. The rule of law can be described as the backbone of the modern constitutional democracy and a prerequisite for the protection of all fundamental values listed in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. In other words, the rule of law acts as a conjunctive glue that holds the Union together, as well as affects every aspect of the Union's work. From fundamental rights to a well-functioning single market. The Finnish presidency wants to reinforce the EU's existing rule of law toolbox. Although we can proudly proclaim all the significant leaps we have taken towards the right directions since the Tampere milestones, we must be careful not to take any steps backwards. Thus, in action, it's not an option. If we truly are to stay true to our common values, we need to continue forwards. Therefore, the Finnish presidency welcomes the Commission's recent communication on strengthening the rule of law and on establishing a new annual reporting mechanism. Freedom requires a genuine area of justice. This was also one of the key messages of the Tampere milestones. A genuine area of justice is real when people feel comfortable approaching courts and authorities regardless of the member state. Moreover, it's real when criminals cannot exploit differences in the judicial systems of member states. 
Furthermore, it's real when judgments and decisions from all member states are respected and enforced. In a genuine European area of justice, individuals should not be prevented or discouraged from exercising their rights. We always have to remember that we are building a Europe, not for institutions, nor for member states, but for the European citizens. The effectiveness, independence, and quality of national justice systems are key aspects of the rule of law, and they play a key role in the European area of freedom, security, and justice. Ladies and gentlemen, the necessity of our common value, value base is multidimensional. Take, for example, the field of security. We need to set our sights on a comprehensive approach to ensuring security. This is also a priority of the Finnish presidency. Internal security is a product of a chain of actions and actors. In order to combat cross-border crime, the chain must work effectively. Security requires an efficient chain of criminal proceedings and therefore well-functioning criminal cooperation between member states. In 2002, as requested by the Tampere European Council, Eurojust was established to improve cooperation in the fight against serious cross-border crime. Today, we can proudly proclaim that Eurojust has become an important security actor and has helped to build mutual trust between member states. Therefore, we must continue developing Eurojust. Particularly, we need to ensure that Eurojust is ready for the digital age. Next year, the European Prosecutor's Office, EPO, will join the action along, along Eurojust in a strong authority uh, to protect the Union's budget from fraud. The Finnish presidency is fully committed to the swift setting up of the EPO. To conclude, I think today's message can be divided into three equally important points. First of all, our initial, initial objective has been to strive for proper functioning of our societies and the policies of the Union. Thus, from the get-go, the European integration has been firmly rooted in a shared desire to commit to human rights, democratic institutions, and the rule of law. Therefore, our or original driving force for a better future needs to be continuously reinforced. Secondly, we can note the aftermath of the temporary milestones with contentment. But we also need to remind ourselves of all the milestones yet to be achieved. This means that we need to constantly reinforce the cooperation within the Union by, by, among other things, fostering the mutual trust between member states. As mentioned before, the protection of our common values also means the protection of the system of mutual recognition in the EU. Thirdly, we should not view our shared common values only as a historical building block. 
but as the necessary components for future developments, as well as the enabling forces to build a sustainable Europe and a sustainable future. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not sure that anybody could have foreseen the current development of the area of freedom, security, and justice some 30 years ago. Moreover, even 20 years ago, when the area actually was established, I don't think anybody could have foreseen all the achievements of today. Maybe all the progress achieved today were only dreams back then. Or alternatively, maybe all the achievements of today were perceived to be impossible. The truth is that we have in fact reached many unimaginable things in this area. Therefore, I also hope that within the next 20 years, we continue to achieve more things that are currently unimaginable. Or at least, I hope our current goals are excessively pessimistic. However, we have to continue to work hard to develop the area, and we cannot stop dreaming about the next goals to be reached. Thank you. Stay uh, here because we'll have a panel discussion now, which I hope you can join. And that's a pity then, but anyway, uh, we'll have uh, four other very good panelists, or five basically, if I can uh, call them to the stage. Uh, and in fact, we'll certainly contribute to the discussion which, we, which you have launched. I mean, I recall the words which you raised, like trust, rule of law. Uh, yeah, common citizenship, mutual recognition, uh, trust between systems, cooperation. And I think, let's say, through what you have said, you have seen, um, you certainly said what has been achieved by the EU already over these last 20 years. But you also indicate, or what I often hear, let's say, that a lot remains to be done. So certainly, thanks a lot for setting the stage for these discussions, let's say, in the next uh, panel. So if I could invite now the... Um, panelists to the, to the podium. I mean, there is the ambassador of Croatia to the EU. Very happy, let's say, that Chico joined us. The ambassador, as you know, Croatia will, have the next, will be the next to have the uh, chairmanship of the uh, EU Council and is certainly preparing busily for these matters. And was before that, let's say, working in the commission amongst others for the um, commissioner in charge of uh, Niven Mimika of communication amongst others. Um, we have... Um, Andrew Jettis, uh, I, I don't know where you were living at 2.30 or so, Andrew, you will not be joining. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, then we have Christine Roger, who is um, um, in the council, but uh, I know her basically from her time in the commission. So she, she swapped from the uh, com commission to the council and has been in totally different positions in the past, but is now dealing with these matters within the, uh, within the council. Then we have uh, Alexandra Jur Schroeder, who's from the permanent representation of uh, Germany to the EU, correct? Yeah? No. <laughs> sorry? Uh, ah, sorry, also from the commission. That's it. Then I have it wrong. It's Katharina, which is from, uh, sorry. I, it's Katharina, who's from the German. And, and you're director of DG, DG Justice. So um, thank you, and sorry, let's say, for this, uh, for this mistake. So we start probably with... Um, Irena, so just to say a bit how you look at this subject and how you're preparing as uh, ambassador for the chairmanship of the, or say the, the presidency of the EU Council. You can stay there if you wish. You have to just put it on. Maybe everybody can hear. No, no, you just really put it no. on. Okay. Yeah, it's live streamed, so that's, uh, that's why, let's say, we want to have this as well. <laughs> Um, well Thank recorded. 
Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I just currently joined, actually, the permanent representation, so I'm the new permanent representative of Croatia to uh, prepare the presidency, but also to <laughs> um, uh, push some of the uh, uh, things that uh, we uh, will either inherit um, from the current institutional cycle, the current presidency, the current commission back, you know, and f follow it up uh, in the new institutional council, meaning the new commission, hopefully on the 1st of uh, November, the new president of the European Council on the 1st of December, and then 1st of January, um, we come as the presidency following up to the, the Finnish presidency that has very coincidentally now <laughs> celebrating the 20 years of the Tampere, but um, our wish is to then follow it up with Zagreb program. Uh, so that will be the first message that I have for you today. But before I come to next year, I, uh, I was just thinking, listening to, to your speech, where I was 20 years ago, and then actually I realized I was, I was writing my master's degree that was actually uh, about third countries nationals in the EU and whether there is any room for them in the concept of EU citizenship. At the time it was Amsterdam Treaty and I couldn't have imagined that I will 20 <laughs> years afterwards be sitting here after Lisbon Treaty. Um, after a, a lot of uh, uh, changes, uh, humongous difference between those two moments in life uh, that actually went over a period of time to touch on negotiating, for instance, on chapters, famous chapters 23 and 24 on justice and home affairs chapters uh, with the new methodology uh, as an accession country. And that time as well, you know, it was kind of, you know, a lot have, has changed at that moment uh, since 99. Um, and then uh, we went through there, uh, that process joined the, the EU, and then uh, these days we have a secretariat, sec Secretary General of the Council of Europe, who is a former foreign minister, Yesterday, I was at a hearing of uh, the next vice president of the commission from Croatia, Mrs. Schulze, who was mentioning Article 2, I don't know how many times, during her presentations and answering of the questions. Um, and then uh, the other day, I was sitting in, in meetings uh, uh, together with colleagues uh, uh, discussing the nomination of the public prosecutor of the European Union, which is completely unimaginable at that time, that we, we will come to that, that the European Union level will cover something like that, which is a huge no-no at the time, because, of course, the member states had a competence. Um, and it was it was a third pillar uh, 20 years ago, and uh, it was it was uh, something that uh, we discussed among the member states uh, even some years ago, only. And then today, these days, we are discussing rule of law concept, which is becoming the con the term, uh, I guess, uh, uh, to to discuss. And now we have to go over uh, again, perhaps come to the roots and really see why is there, how, how it came about and what, has it, what it means. So those will be the questions that we will be tackling during the presidency. Um, how to take it forward, how to have a meaningful program for the next five years um, that will be effective, that will assist the overall functioning of the European Union. Um, that will assist in um, shaping the societies and touching on not, not on only the rights uh, of the people, but also their security, also their data to, that need to be protected, um, also to um, counter uh, fake news and cyber attacks, um, to build trust between uh, member states, institutions, they have to implement and trust each other in order for this to work. Um, 
and not only to be discussing concepts and legal proposals, but also to have proper discussions of why these instruments are there, wh what they are contributing to, and why they are hugely relevant, and why we had such a jump from third pillar Amsterdam to Lisbon um, cross pillar uh, situation where justice and home affairs or area of uh, freedom, security and justice is the key for proper functioning of the European Union these days. Um, I can now tell you what we think Zagreb program should entail, but I don't think you will be surprised that we will have to <laughs> take and follow up on many, many pillars of the current uh, activities and programs. So I will not go through everything and all the pillars and all the priorities because I'm sure over these two days you tackled many of these. Um, but I will just mention a couple that we will, from our end, find to be extremely important. Um, I'll start with um, Schengen and returning to proper functioning of, of Schengen, which is actually a precondition of its enlargement, and there we are hugely <laughs> um, nationally as well interested because we uh, have to yet to come into the Schengen area as a country. Then I will link it to migration, and there we really need to find ways to have it as a holistic, comprehensive policy with all the elements tackled, roots, and all the issues tackled equally and rightly uh, uh, addressed, not only focusing on one or the other uh, part of the whole conversation. That has to entail legal but also irregular and illegal migration but also it has to tackle the humanity of the whole problem in our opinion. Then I will maybe touch on the issues that are actually global challenges related. <laughs> that will be the areas around uh, cyber attacks or digitalization and its influence on the society and what we have to do how to make things safer, but also more effective, and how to build resilience of, of, of the union. And then perhaps for the end, I will just mention the, the civil criminal judiciary systems uh, issues. I mean, they are, from our angle, the pillars of um, citizens trust or mistrust into in the in the in the institutions so there i think that european union level and that conversation is hugely important and not only just to speak about issues around rule of law and article 7 but to really have the connection between the functioning of the institutions and citizens rights so that the be connected to why it's, it's important for the people and not only for procedures and processes that are not so close to, 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 to people to understand. Um, and there we will be uh, having uh, a lot of discussions uh, with the colleagues, the member states, the colleagues from, from the commission, the council and everybody else, <laughs> I think to make it uh, a, a nicely balanced uh, uh, proposal uh, for everybody to be kind of uh, feeling that they can take ownership of it and that they feel included into the discussion and that maybe we can alleviate some of the current tensions that are very much felt um, specifically in the, in the body that I'm sitting in together with, with the colleagues around. So thank you very much and uh, I, I Thank you, Irina. Nice if I could add, is there something specific you will signal during your presidency? Or you want to take out, or you're still working on it, of course, I imagine. Is there something which, from a Croatian perspective, is something you say, look, we would like to focus upon that? Uh, we are still working on that. But as you saw from my, uh, 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 
presentation. <laughs> uh, there is the, the, what we want to focus on is this um, building of trust and inclusivity and moving away from divisions even when we speak on the rule of law. Important issue which also Marlene um, focused upon and uh, again I'm an outsider to this debate. I follow other areas of EU policies uh, but it's interesting to hear that and also this focus which you say on mutual recognition which I personally think is a really a building block uh, for many EU policies and certainly the policy I follow mostly financial services we have sometimes forgotten it a bit because we have focused too much towards single rule books and then Mutual recognition doesn't work necessarily anymore, but mutual recognition is, I think, the uh, key. Yes, we have many instruments these days, mechanisms, ideas, proposals, uh, monitoring, uh, whatever, <laughs> but we, I think, have to come to the core of why people would need to feel how, I mean, the, the concepts, they don't feel very, very much. They don't know actually what it means, but when you are faced uh, yeah, with... Uh, I don't know, uh, an individual problem and you go to court, then you do feel it. <laughs> so <laughs> we have to link our terminology with something that is understandable to, to, to the ordinary citizens. That was uh, very clear, but also a good uh, continuation, let's say, of what we heard in the, in the previous talk. If I can pass the floor to Christine Roger, who was, uh, as I said before, working in the commission, but in different cabinets dealing with different issues, but now in the council uh, dealing with these matters, uh, director for home affairs and the general secretary of the council, Christine. Director general for justice and home affairs. Yes, the whole thing. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm very glad that um, SEPS and the Finnish presidency uh, have decided to have this gathering uh, for two days. When we started preparing the presidency uh, a few months ago, uh, I asked the question, what about tempéré? And uh, I found the presidency quite modest about it. Is ah oui, tempéré, yes. Uh, and I said, well, it's the great time to celebrate because those are 20 years, but uh, we, we know the Finns, they're hardworking and, um, and yeah, they just work and uh, bragging is, is not uh, their forte. So, but still, we do have here an opportunity to remember uh, how this came about. And I personally, at the time, was working in the commission in Jacques Santerre's office. Uh, and I very vividly remember when uh, Adrian Fortescue, uh, a colleague who unfortunately left us, um, and our team in Jacques Santerre's office said, look, uh, Amsterdam is going to enter into force. Uh, we need to do something about justice and home affairs. So we prepared this, uh, this, this program together with an old friend who's here in, in this room, Jean-Louis de Rauer, who was uh, one of the real fathers of, of uh, Tempéré, and, uh, and then convinced the uh, fin incoming Finnish presidency and, and Pavel Lippon in, in, in particular that this was the thing to to carry forward, and they did with great enthusiasm. And then afterwards, Another father, um, Antonio Vittorino, and Alexandra has been working with him in developing this uh, within the commission in a way which I found absolutely uh, astounding. The way this was taken forward, the drive that we had experienced uh, with Tempéré and the follow-up to it was, was really incredible. We really had the feeling that something was happening and something extremely meaningful. So yes, uh, it's good to celebrate, it's good to remember. Uh, I have brought with me a little picture of Tempéré. Ah, yes, we don't have the right to have, um, but still, um, it's not a big room. There are milestones here. You can see stones on the floor. Uh, and uh, this indeed were the little stones uh, which were invented at the time, and those stones are, are still with us. Uh, I think uh, many, many ideas were in Tempéré that we have not fully developed. Uh, and to me, Tempéré is still valid. Uh, the notions that were incorporated in Tempéré at the time uh, are still with us. Um, common European asylum and migration policy, still to be developed. A genuine area of justice, lots of progress, but still under development. Fight against crime, yes indeed, crime has changed. Uh, and so should our methods, so still we have to adapt all the time. 
and stronger external action is also uh, under development. So in a way, I don't see uh, that we can really improve on the general ideas that we had at the time, which I think will be with us for the next 20 years and, and beyond. Of course, now we have the new treaty. So we have Article 68 of the treaty, uh, which says that the European Council should develop strategic guidelines uh, for legislative and operational planning in the field of freedom, security, and justice. So this is what we did in 2014 uh, to guide the work of uh, the Council in general, together with the Commission and the Parliament. Um, to me, if we try to see what needs to be done, and we've achieved a lot, as previous speakers have underlined, I still think that um, we are too slow on legislation. I think we are a bit weak uh, in implementation. We have lots of new legislation, but how is it currently carried out in member states? Uh, it's a very difficult task, but I don't think we're uh, quite there yet. We have uh, a big issue with mutual trust. Uh, as has been uh, outlined. And we have a big issue with the rule of law as well. So those are the areas where I think our efforts should, uh, should bear, not to reinvent where we should be going, but perhaps looking at how we're going there and how we go about delivering on those priorities. We do not necessarily need to change priorities. We need to see how we get there, which uh, in a way is what happened, uh, what was outlined in the strategic agenda, which was adopted by the European Council in uh, June. I recommend to you uh, reading this paper, new picture. Please look on our website and read it. It's a very good piece of paper and it contains a lot of uh, interesting ideas for the future, uh, especially in the two first areas uh, of this strategic agenda, which is first protecting citizens and freedoms, plural, uh, and secondly developing our economic base, the two first priorities. If I, and I should have said this from the start, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Council, this is a personal view. My personal view when developing those two um, work strands is that there are probably four areas where we should uh, be very active in the coming years. The first one has been mentioned, yes, fundamental rights, protecting democratic societal modes, rule of law, uh, the Finnish presidency has indeed uh, very much uh, said whatever there's to be said here, we, we need to do something. That's pretty obvious. The second one is, again, something which has been mentioned, mutual trust. This is really the cornerstone, the basis upon which we develop our common policies. How do we develop this? Uh, through legislation, yes, in a way. Um, there are two things that maybe we should consider for the future. One is uh, within the Commission. There's the notion that member states sh perhaps should get more support uh, in developing the way their systems are functioning. Sometimes there are big political problems that we all know about, but sometimes it's just a difficulty to, for administrations to cope with the requirements. Uh, of EU legislation, it's, it's organization, so it's uh, support, but it's also uh, finance. So the notion that the Commission could be even, they, they were being very active to be, to be fair, but they could be even more by structuring the support that they give to member states in Im implementing EU law, especially in the field of, of justice and home affair. I think there's a service in the Secretary General of the Commission uh, but maybe this is something that would be worth uh, perhaps expanding. Another area that could help develop mutual trust, another possibility is uh, within the treaty, it's Article 70 of the treaty, which says that uh, mutual evaluation 
in the field of justice and home affair uh, can be organized uh, in a sort of peer system. It's a system which already exists for Schengen, for instance, evaluation system. It also exists for um, in, in, in the field of um, criminal justice. This is something that we still are running within the Council Secretariat. I think there is scope for expanding this Article 70 procedure to the whole of justice and home affairs and encourage mutual evaluation between member states uh, under the, uh, organ through the organization that the Commission would, uh, would put in place. So I think this should definitely be looked at because it's, uh, it's quite important that member states know what's going on and that they bring expertise and knowledge. Uh, and then the Commission come and help through uh, support. So that's the second area that I think we should look at. Um, the third one is integrity of um, our territory and common borders, um, migratory policy, terrorism, cross-border crime. We all know how difficult it is, but we need to get our acts together here. And again, looking at the tempere spirit to see how we can jointly uh, protect our common space. Uh, there are issues of sovereignty, we know that but we're all in the same boat, so to speak. So it's European territory, which has to be perhaps protected in a more European spirit. The last area I would like to quickly mention is technology, artificial intelligence. Uh, here I, we have, from the economic side, we have the notion that yes, the EU should matter in this area. It's, it's difficult because we're lagging behind, obviously, and if we want to continue to matter, um, my personal assessment is that we probably need some kind of framework uh, in which these new activity, economic activity, can develop in a way which is compatible with uh, European values. So that looks like, to me, like a global framework for the development of artificial intelligence, including data security, including data protection, ethics, rights and values, um, that's a big field, but definitely I think we should uh, work also in this direction. So to uh, end this very short uh, presentation, I, wouldn't, I, I would think that there's no need really to rewrite Tempere. I think everything is in Tempere. We need just to, uh, well, just do it. And uh, probably, you know, you're only born once, so tempéré, yes, uh, and then take it fr from their own, and this is where all institutions should, uh, should play a part, commission to start with, council, parliament, all going in the same direction, which, by the way, is the direction which the treaty tells us we should be going. Thank you, Christine. That was clear, also clear to have the council's perspective and um, how this... Uh, say the Council Secretariat's perspective, how this fits into to this process. Uh, we move to the Commission, Alexandra Jur Schroeder, who's in the, in the Director of the Criminal Justice Directorate in the Director General for Justice and Consumers of the European Commission. Uh, she develops uh, legislation in this field, amongst other matters, issues related to criminal matters regarding fighting against crime, and specifically focusing on money laundering or finding money laundering and other matters, uh, which is interesting because we at SEPS will just start a task force on this because we, but my financial hat, we see that this is a big problem if you look at it from the banking sector perspective. So I will certainly be in touch with you in the future on that. But anyway, I pass you the floor. How you see this from a commission perspective, uh, from DG Justice perspective, how these things have advanced uh, over the last 20 years or probably a more short term perspective. Thank you. Does it work? Yes. First of all, thank you very much for your wor welcome and also for organizing this conference and also my special thanks uh, to the Finnish presidency. Actually, I'm not only director in DG Justice, but I'm what is called a contemporary witness. Uh, because when all this started 20 years ago with a temporary program, I had the privilege to be a member of Antonio Vitorino's cabinet 
who was at the time the first European Commissioner for Justice and Home Affairs, which was quite unusual, because this was not really the Commission who played a big role in all this. And you know, as it is uh, with contemporary witnesses, they sometimes get a little bit sentimental looking back. And therefore, I would like to share with you very quickly maybe two uh, sentimental moments in my past uh, in this area that are date back uh, to the times of the Tumblr program when we all started. Uh, the first, and I think I have taken this out because I think it is a subject that is also a subject for the future, is environmental crime. Um, those who know the temporal conclusions will know point 48 where there is a list of offenses uh, that should be looked into from a European perspective and one is environmental crime and at the time with Antonio Vitorino we thought this is a very good idea and we started to develop rules. Uh, we got a lot of support for that but I must say we took a courageous step because we adopted a, a proposal for a directive. This is maybe more for lawyers, not for citizens, but at this time it was a revolution because it was an instrument that was not common in this area. Uh, and I remember well when Antonio Vitorino presented our initiative to the meeting of the Council of Ministers, there was silence in the room and I think many thought the Commission has just done something that is legally uh, not right and will never materialize. I spare you all the details. We had a bit of an institutional <laughs> controversy between the Council and the Commission and in the end the European Court of Justice said yes uh, in this area because this is also community law, you can do a directive. Why I'm telling you this is because all this in the end ended up in the Lisbon Treaty. We have now Article 83, Paragraph 2. So I think it is a very good example how our work here, and sometimes we do this a bit in dialogues, uh, can really materialize into something. Second uh, sentimental moment I would like to share very briefly with you. Dates back to a sunny afternoon in Brussels. It was just a few days uh, after the summer holiday in 2001. I remember well that we in the Vittorino cabinet were just about to start a meeting with our colleagues in DG Justice because we wanted to discuss whether there is a way out for the very difficult negotiations on the European arrest warrant. Uh, at that moment, my colleague Georges came in the room and said, you know, there is an airplane that has just crashed in the World Trade Center. And you will know it was the 11th September 2001. And with that, uh, I must say it was a game changer. Uh, there was suddenly the awareness that not everything is good in the world, that we have to join forces together, at least in Europe, if not internationally, to address terrorism and other serious crimes. In the end, we could finalize the European arrest warrant negotiations in very good time. And now it is 17 years that we have this instrument in place. So this is just a bit a look back uh, to the past. Uh, but let's, after my sentimental journey, look a bit also in the future. And here my first message uh, would be, and this is very much in line what has already said this afternoon, that we must not lose ground to maintain efficient, trustful cooperation in civil criminal matters and all in all. I must say this morning I looked again in the temporal conclusions and they're still very interesting to read and they are very to, the sp to, to our actual needs. And I was looking into point 33 of the temporal conclusions where this is a very good message saying enhanced mutual recognition of judicial decisions and judgments would facilitate cooperation between authorities and the protection of individual rights. And therefore, the European Council endorses the principle of mutual recognition, which should become the cornerstone of judicial cooperation, but also for mutual trust. Therefore, I would say that today, conclusion 33 is as important as it was at that time, if it's not even more important than it was 20 years ago. However, and I have to echo what has been said, this is not a given. I think we have to work very closely all together to set the right EU legal framework to uphold the principle of mutual recognition 
which is built on mutual trust. Um, let me perhaps uh, come back to an example we have in, in the area of criminal law. I think also with the establishment of Eurojust, uh, which is now hopefully even more operational, uh, with the new rules that will be in place in December, we have also a very, let's say, practical actor to foster this mutual cooperation and mutual trust. When we started with Eurojust, Eurojust had strong difficulties to have cases because people didn't really know that it exists, they didn't really see the added value. Again, if you look back to the situation we had then and the situation we have today, I think this is exactly a very good uh, practical tool to enhance mutual cooperation, mutual trust, and simply because people speak to each other, because they see if they use a European body in this area, things go better, they can speak together, languages are no longer an obstacle, you can have concrete results, you can meet with colleagues, in the joint investigative uh, teams and centers, and you also realize that often the others have the same problems you have. You have too much pressure, maybe from the political level, you have too many cases on your table, and therefore I think with uh, Eurojust, uh, we have a very good actor in the area of criminal law, and we have to work also that Eurojust remains uh, operational um, in the future. The second element, I think this is also an important factor and it has been raised by everybody, is the, uh, that our societies get more and more digitalized. That was something we didn't have so much when we had temporary 20 years ago. And this is something we have to factor in, in our new policies. Um, again, I think uh, looking just to Eurojust, we have to make sure that Eurojust can further cooperate with member states that this is also technically equipped to do that. Uh, but looking beyond that, uh, we will have to see how we deal with the fact that we have more or less that we are living in a digitalized world. I would like to briefly mention our proposal we have made on access to electronic evidence uh, because we have done this as we feel that the normal mutual legal assistance rules we have are still okay, but they are not absolutely suited to uh, yeah, fight crime in our societies. I'm well aware that there are concerns here and there that uh, we should not go away in uh, doing a step change in the criminal cooperation with uh, our principles of a fair trial, but I think we can in the end very well combine, as you also said um, uh, in your introductory speech, uh, that we have swift procedures but in full accordance with fundamental law. Allow me uh, a few words also on um, the rule of law, fundamental rights. I think we have actually another birthday to celebrate, 10 years of the Charter. Um, so many, many occasions to have a drink and to, to be happy. Um, but there is indeed a point that was raised that uh, there is still not sufficient awareness in the citizens in the Euro our European countries about the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and this is also certainly something we would like and we need to change. There are various possibilities to do this. I think we have still to work on our communication tools. This is not that we don't do that, but I think they are to make this more user-friendly is important. I think we have to work on training, uh, and I think we would like also to do with the Croatian uh, presidency a, a big initiative on, uh, on training. Uh, and of course, the, ro the role of money in all this is not, an, uh, is not a small one. And it's like it is. And so let's hope that we find a good agreement in the MFF. Uh, there are many other needs to spend money, but I think this is certainly a very important area uh, also to spend money uh, in order to make this happen. Maybe last point on this specific issue with the Charter. Uh, we have done a couple of concrete instruments to protect uh, fundamental rights. We have done a lot of things in enhancing defense rights for people in court. We will come uh, now with the protection of whistleblowers. I think these are really concrete measures in the end. This is not just high level fundamental principles, but really something that people may see, okay, the European Union is taking care of me. What do I do in a situation if by accident I become under suspicion of a country that is not my home country. I have done nothing, I don't speak the language. 
so that you can say you have a right of interpretation, you have a right to take a lawyer, you will get some legal aid assistance. I think this is also what will make people more aware that we are based on right uh, and uh, we are legal community. Um, on the rule of law, I don't will really say a lot today, but it's certainly uh, one of our priorities with the new commission. It has been put very much in the forefront of Commissioner designated Mr. Renders, and we will certainly work a lot. We have to put some thoughts what we do with the rule of law review mechanism, but I'm pretty sure that we will come out with something uh, very meaningful. Um, with all this, I would say we can be quite proud of what has been done in Tampere. Uh, it was a bit uh, an experi experiment, but on the other hand, I'm pretty sure that we still have to do much more. We have to go with the time. We have to see what our, our challenges. I'm happy that we do this together with the Council Secretariat, with the European Parliament, and also with the presidencies. And therefore, I leave it for the moment here. And I'm, of course, also happy to take all your questions. Thank you, and uh, good to hear also, let's say, that from your perspective you see this uh, positive development, uh, or say this enormous step forward, which probably European citizens do not sufficiently realize, but there is a lot, let's say, in the sense which we have advanced uh, to the benefit of European citizens overall. We also have another presidency, coming presidency present, which is the German presidency, which will be after the Croatian presidency. Basically, we have the trio presidencies uh, present here, so we can also briefly see what the German presidency of the uh, EU Council will, uh, how they will be taking on that issue. Uh, so Katarina, who's working in the German Perm Rep, the head of unit, is uh, joining us and will also say a few words about how she sees this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, thank you also from my side for inviting me here and having this um, uh, opportunity to be participating in this extremely interesting debate. Uh, indeed, I'm head of unit in the German Perm Rep. Um, dealing with the internal security issues. So I focus on police cooperation, anti-terrorism, cybercrime, hybrid threats. Um, so that's just to say that I might be uh, seeing it mainly from this um, uh, internal security side. Um, yeah, a few thoughts from, from, from my side and a um, bit of an outlook maybe to the German presidency. Um, in 1999, I personally worked on something completely different. Um, so I can't give you my, my own experience from the time, but um, I'm uh, inter alia, I'm a historian by training, so I was digging into the archives a bit and came up with a lot of very interesting um, documents uh, produced at the time. And, um, and I um, can only share what all of you have really been saying, that um, it's really amazing to see how far uh, Europe has moved in these 20 years. Um, when you read the document preparing actually for the temporary council, there was virtually nothing. Um, and I found one which actually said uh, on the 1st of July, Europol, something called Europol has taken up work. And if you go to Den Haag today and see this a big building and a lot of people who are working in there, that's, that's, that's quite impressive. Um, the other thing is that uh, what I also read at the time is that people were saying that uh, um, after the common market um, and the common uh, currency and the euro, this is the next big integration project. Um, and I think that's very true um, as well to say, you know, we've, we've, if you have a common market and you have the open borders and you have the free circulation of people, then somehow you have to take it to, to the next step of political um, development of the next step of integration. And that's what's happening. And I mean, You've all been saying that as well. Of course, it's not all always easy, uh, but I think we can still say we've, we've really come a, um, a long, a long way in that direction. Um, what I also find striking, if you look at the treaty itself, um, it actually contains that correlation between free movement of people and the common market and um, the security side of it. Um, that correlation that, of course, if you have free movement, um, of course we have free movement of crime, so to speak. So, of course, the crime is going cross-border, but then that means that you've simply got to cooperate uh, on the um, police side and on the law enforcement side. Um, and what is so striking in the treaty is that 
you're somehow decoupling the idea that you need a border to actually have controls. Um, on, um, so if you want to do police work, you don't necessarily need a border for that. Um, it's sort of overcoming that idea of a border. Um, and I think that is actually good taking integration quite quite far. So that, that legal base we have in the treaty there is, is um, a really, really strong one and, and one which gives us um, a good base to do many things by way of, uh, of legislation, which have already um, been mentioned. Um, all my um, speakers before me have all mentioned this issue of trust um, and I was going to mention that as well, but this, this, is, this is really, really, I think, the important um, issue here. How do you do the trust building you need for that, for this idea of saying, yes, we have this open space um, and we have the free circulation and then we will also have to trust each other that we actually mean the same thing when we are talking about police work and um, law enforcement. So um, that is, I think, something which we still need to, to build on, but also which we are actually building on. And um, there again, if you look at the treaty, it actually mentions that, even that idea of trust building, because it says that member states have to enable um, their institutions to cooperate as much as possible so that you simply have people meeting and discussing this. Um, and I think that is really a very important exercise also of the, the whole exercise, um, that you get up on all levels so that you ha actually have the people doing the ground works in the police forces uh, from the law enforcement side that they can actually just meet and exchange and build trust amongst um, themselves. Um, but that goes up, I think, also to the highest levels of lawmaking, of ministers actually meeting in the council and having this same process of getting to know each other and knowing how they can cooperate and um, work on this. Um, so I think that's somehow nicely sums up where we are, that you know, we've got a strong legal base, we've come quite a long way, and we're still working on this, on this trust issue, and we're still um, working on really getting to know each other and, and um, getting to, um, to trust each other. Um, yeah, um, if you want to hear what the um, German presidency is, is going to do here, um, uh, I mean, it won't surprise you know, that you know, there's a lot of issues, of course, which have already been mentioned by the Croatian ambassador, which will uh, be on our agenda as well. Of course, this is um, a process, um, we're, we're all part of a process here, which, which is, of course, ongoing, and um, after all, six months are not that long, so <laughs> supposedly we will still be taking over um, some issues from you. Um, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm rather more working on the uh, internal security side, so um, it's a difficult, bit difficult for me to be talking about the migration issue, but of course that one is one which will, of course, still be high um, on the agenda. Um, and I completely agree with, with what the Croatian ambassador was saying here, that this needs to be looked at, well, the whole picture of it needs to be taken into account and needs to be looked at in an... Um, holistic and integrative um, way. Um, but there again, I think the way we are looking at it for presidency is that um, you need this also this correlation between, um, again, the external dimension of these policies and the internal dimension of these policies. And of course, if we're talking about a common asylum system, uh, if we're talking about managing our external borders um, jointly, and as Christine Roger was putting it, protecting our territory, um, together that needs to have this correlation with what are we doing on our internal borders, of course. Um, and then here we're very much uh, committed to this idea again of, well, we call it uh, in a bit of a short version, back to Schengen, which really means that we would really like to come back uh, to a situation where we will not need the internal border controls anymore. We, we needed them uh, at the moment for sort of <laughs> as an emergency measure. We'd really like to come back to a situation where we will not need that anymore. And that, of course, um, needs a lot of compensatory measures yet again. You know, we don't need necessarily need the border as the um, control post, but still um, you have to so do something by way of putting the control somewhere else. Um, so that, of course, brings me um, to the issue of um, databases and 
exchange of police data. Um, I think you're all aware of the um, adopted legislation, of course, on the so-called um, interoperability of um, uh, the police databases. Um, there are many of them, and uh, the idea of this legislation was to um, make things much easier by making them interoperable and uh, so make it easier actually for the police forces to access these different um, databases in a more efficient way. Um, yet again, I'm very much aware there are many concerns about that, um, especially in the field of data protection. Um, but then if you see it from, from that side of things and think this is something which is actually there to enable practitioners um, to work more efficiently on the security of citizens, um, then it really makes a lot of sense in this context of, um, again, an, an area of freedom and, and, and security. Um, as I said, that legislation is adopted and we're working on the implementation and that is surely something which um, will still be a topic um, during, during our um, presidency. Um, having said that, we may be also um, going to take a look at the, um, uh, the existing mostly bilateral treaties um, on police cooperation, which uh, actually exist, uh, but which need continuous sort of reworking and uh, renewal. Um, we maybe also have to take a little look at um, what exactly is it that we want the, all the existing agencies to do. We tend to give them a lot of tasks, <laughs> um, but maybe it's also a, bit, um, a point where we have to look at more closely at what exactly is it what we want them to do, and if we want them to do a lot of things, how can we actually uh, make sure they have the, all the resources they need to do that? Um, and then definitely um, we're also trying uh, to, to uh, focus on other topics uh, which have already been mentioned, which have of course a lot to do with the digital age. Um, I mean there's for one thing um, sort of rather classical, if I may so, cybercrime, which we need to combat. I mean, um, there's a lot of gangs um, organized cross-border in Europe, uh, which sort of break into your computer and uh, simply ransom your computer, and so you have to pay a ransom if you want to see your files again. And this is also something where definitely, you know, police forces need to cooperate cross-border on. Um, that's the one side of this, but then there's also, of course, um, all the other... Um, problems you might have with um, cyber security and then also of course um, in the net one thing which is also rather uh, keeping us as busy um, the contents of what you can actually put uh, on the net for the moment um, the Finnish presidency is uh, now still working on the um, regulation on terrorist contents online um, we'll see how far um, you get during your Finnish presidency with that or even during the Croatian presidency uh, but that's the whole question of, you know, sort of rather more radicalization, um, which can come, ab come about through the, the web. Um, and I think where we simply need to concern ourselves with by way of uh, a more societal approach to um, how can we avoid radicalization of people um, through, um, through the web. Yeah, so that's um, a few ideas um, from our side. Um, of course, we're very much... Um, also already now discussing with our Finnish friends, with our Croatian friends, um, and of course with Council Secretariat and, and, uh, um, and the Commission. Um, and um, me too, somebody said it before me as well. I'm, I'm really very, very curious um, to see where we'll be uh, in, what would it be then, 2039, uh, when I think a lot of us uh, may actually be retired. Um, <laughs> so, and then we can all meet again and look back <laughs> to what our successes are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Certainly good to hear that, let's say, that the, pre uh, the presidencies are well coordinated amongst them and that also the council and the commission are uh, good interconnected with them, let's say, and that these things are progressing. If I can ask a few final words to my colleague Sergio, who's been with us since, I think, 2005, Sergio, if I remember correctly, so leading this program now since about some time, and as I said, leading an entire team here in SEPS on these matters. Also, if I could add, Sergio just won a huge um, H2020 project with institutes from all over the world, even, on ASYL. So he can explain this, of course, I or probably doesn't need to explain it, you know what ASYL is about. Of course, if you call it ASYL, it's about asylum. So, uh, Sergio, some final considerations, and then we have a, we open it up to questions.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, and thank you to all the panelists for the contributions. It's really, I'm really happy uh, to be here and to celebrate the Tampere 20-year anniversary. Um, I would like to start by thanking the, the Finnish uh, presidency and the permanent representation uh, colleagues for their cooperation and their collaboration in making this event possible. It's been a fascinating two-day uh, event. Um, and I was also very happy to bring together colleagues, friends, uh, people who have been at the heart of the making of uh, the area freedom, security, and justice agenda together, and uh, also implementing the role that SEPS, uh, I think, does uh, best, uh, which is bridging academic knowledge to inform uh, policy, policy discussions. And uh, we had, indeed, a very detailed and uh, informative debate, which uh, will be uh, reflected in a book for those of you who didn't have the, the opportunity uh, to join us. Uh, this will be uh, published and all the contributions will be there and accessible. Our key priority was to take a stock, um, but also identify priorities for the years uh, to come. And I think uh, what you can expect from my contribution is few takeaways. Uh, I wouldn't do justice if I if would even try to synthesize everything we've discussed, but certainly there were uh, very important uh, takeaways um, that may be helpful when informing the next presidencies, this and next presidencies program on justice and home affairs. And indeed, there's been so much done. You know, the dynam dynamism, uh, very few could have expected really 20 years ago where we are now in terms of massive progress. And a uh, few of the speakers who participated in yesterday's and today's uh, event highlighted the development of this sense of community. You know, that the European Union has really contributed in this sense of community, professionalization, uh, common standards, uh, of course, common laws, but also institutions, uh, agencies, which uh, actually are promoting this, you know, professionalization in Europe, uh, which is seen from outside as a key model, as something to, to be praised and to also be followed um, in many different ways. But these areas, we are also aware, are very sensitive to crisis uh, labeling, to emergencies, to insecuritization processes um, as drivers of uh, Europeanization. And uh, they are very sensitive as well, uh, in the sense that some of those instruments may put at stake the very values we've been talking about uh, during this afternoon, uh, which are key priorities for the Finnish uh, presidency, the rule of law, fundamental rights and democracy, and the interaction between these uh, three. If anything, I will uh, highlight as a takeaway from this one day and a half debate is the word legitimacy and rather legitimization as a process. Legitimacy cannot be something taken for granted uh, that can be achieved and that's it. It's a daily work, it's a daily homework and it's a legitimation and uh, we've discussed in detail uh, the sources, what are the recipes for legitimization in the area of freedom and security and justice. And the first one indeed is the rule of law. Uh, the rule of law has been identified uh, by several of our speakers and colleagues. Uh, this idea of checks and balances, you know, keeping the executive under control uh, for the benefit of individuals and democracy. And this idea of consistency with those constitutional traditions, these constitutional principles, which are so dear, is the best way we've designed, we've come about, to design our interactions in society to prevent crimes which have been committed uh, in the past, in the recent European history. And many of the speakers talked about the Lisbon Treaty. We celebrate 20 years anniversary of Tampere program, and it has been mentioned too, 10 years of Lisbon Treaty, as a key milestone as a key game changer in so many ways, not least in the rule of law. So to have the Court of Justice in Luxembourg playing such an active role and such a positive, I think, role in waiving different interests and making sure that at the end of the day, our constitution in the EU, the Lisbon Treaty, is delivered in practice. So another key word that came about was democracy. 
and the citizens have been also mentioned. What about the citizens delivering to the citizens? And these are areas where, you know, there is a lot of contest contestation, you know, different views, different ideas, different opinions, uh, more or less legitimate, you know, in different ways. And this is the, has been identified indeed as something characteristic of democracy. And this also the Lisbon Treaty tried to address by bringing the European Parliament, the European Parliament as co-legislator, as co-owner of the programs, uh, the policy agenda on justice and uh, home affairs in areas that before Parliament didn't have competence in police cooperation, criminal justice. And we've heard about the Zagreb program uh, and we very much look forward to that. Uh, and because of this European Parliament role of co-owner of the agenda, this program will need to be, by definition, interinstitutional. Interinstitutional. You will need to have the European Parliament very much involved, the European Commission very much involved in designing those agendas and designing those uh, priorities. The last source of legitimation is indeed fundamental rights, our fundamental rights. The individual uh, who at the end of the day is the one experiencing the effects of all those policies uh, under justice and home affairs. And here also the Lisbon Treaty has been mentioned, contributed majorly to citizens' protections and individuals, uh, civil liberties and fundamental rights. The EU has been a standard setter globally, the GDPR, data protection, privacy, suspects' rights, was also positive impact. It's been mentioned during the event. So setting standards globally on fundamental rights are also part of core EU identity as outlined in the Lisbon uh, Treaty. Freedom, security, and justice. In the past, there was this idea of the balance between freedom, security, and justice. From the presentations, I was very happy to see that SEP's contribution to this debate has paid off. In a way, we've contributed amongst other actors and institutions. And there is now kind of a building consensus that is not kind of like one without the other, like versus situation. There is no conflict between security and freedom or security and justice. They must go hand to hand. And we've seen in the different presentations how they are increasingly placed as a starting point. Without those, there's, there can be no trust. We've heard that. You know, what are the, again, what, are, what is the recipe for mutual trust? Those principles need to go first. They need to go first for that trust uh, to, uh, to survive. And the last elements to highlight, of course, there are many challenges. There being many, you know, a lot, there has been a lot of progress, but there are also a few challenges ahead. So for example, in the name of crisis, we've seen in the name of European refugee crisis, in the name of terrorism crisis, the risk is eroding the very values we dear. Speed and a quick response, uh, pressures, emergencies, may put those very principles that we all praise at jeopardy. And we've analyzed several examples in, during yesterday and today's debates not least those re related to electronic data and access to inform information exchange. Where does that leave us as citizens? And this, as, an as a citizen, I'm very worried. Where will all this digital evidence, interoperability, where does that leave the citizen? Where does that leave the citizen to uphold our rights and, and freedoms? But also in the name of crisis, we've seen that the European Council has taken a very prominent role despite the fact that you will have expected the European Parliament also to have such an important role, the European Council has taken a lot, a very, very important role in using actually sometimes instruments outside the Lisbon Treaty, outside that rule of law framework of the Lisbon Treaty, like the eu Turkey statement, like joint declarations on readmission, like many other examples that as a lawyer puzzles, puzzle me sometimes and, and trying to figure out what those instruments are, from the perspective of those values, rule of law, fundamental rights, democracy. So that's also very important. And if anything we've learned is that also in these times of crisis, usually it prevails a home affairs policing approach to life. And this life is not only about that, including policies are not only about that. 
And justice, also extremely important. Freedom, extremely important. They need to be waived very carefully, uh, very, very carefully, to have priorities which do not undermine fundamentally other priorities, equally important. So the last point we've mentioned, Schengen, the reform of Dublin, common European asylum system, both at the very foundations of European cooperation and still we've seen also in the name of crisis, refugee crisis, some member states re reversing intergovernmentalism in Schengen, reintroducing internal border controls and that's very, very, um, very risky exercise for the legitimacy, again, legitimation and European legitimation in this area. Or the current debates on Dublin, the reform of Dublin, joint Malta declaration of intent, going outside the Lisbon Treaty, going outside EU policy, sign off as a declaration, not including all member states, not including all member states, voluntarily, as a way to deal with the current challenges, I have my doubts, and also these doubts were expressed during the event today, and uh, as to whether this is a sustainable way forward. So just to conclude, I think that from the debates yesterday and today, we've seen the importance to have a principled agenda, principled agenda on, on justice and home affairs. They are looking at us, some of the speakers were saying, even from abroad, you know, in, in internationally, um, as to how do we deal with or up, uphold our most dear principles um, and this EU model in the Lisbon Treaty, how do we implement that? And I truly believe that this idea that I think Christ, uh, Christine mentioned, that we are all in the same boat. You mentioned that we are all in the same boat. I truly believe that's the case. And including in the European Union, we are all in the same boat. It cannot just be for four countries to go ahead and have you know, asylum relocations. Schengen is also giving a lot of benefits to all member countries. As such, it also brings responsibility for those countries to share responsibility on asylum seekers. So we are indeed, and I think this should be the key goal, that we are all in the same boat. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. We can take a few questions or uh, comments from the panel and then uh, we'll con conclude within 10, 15 minutes. So if somebody wants to raise a point, uh, wants to raise a question, um, yes, if you could introduce yourself and also keep it brief, please. And then there's another question over there. Hello, thank you very much to all the speakers. My name is Agustin Surla. I'm an international relation graduate from LSE. I'm also a Chilean lawyer. Um, my question uh, can be answered, I believe, by all speakers, but I, I'm especially interested in the representatives of the EU member states here. Uh, all speakers have been uh, uh, regarding the importance of trust, of, of trust building in, in, in the conclusions of Tampere and on the developing of the program. And my question is, what do you believe is the reasons of this lack of trust between member states? It's more uh, self-interest of different governments or political affinity? And what do you think is the solutions for this, for this lack of trust? Take the other question also at the same time, please. Uh, my name is Han Vos. I'm a former council minister's official and I have been working only 20, 31 years in the GHA area from 87 until 2008, but that's not so important. But it's the prehistory. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> even, even before that, but I can tell a little time about it. But uh, in regard to Tampere, uh, we had, uh, at that time, it was still mostly intergovernmental, which had some advantages or some disadvantages, but that's not the story. Uh, but uh, the, the, the role of the council secretariat was often uh, important, crucial, always in cooperation with the commission, uh, with uh, Adrian Fortescue and Jean-Louis de Brouwer and Mr. Lobkowitz. But I especially want to mention the names, and uh, Sergio knows them all, of Mr. Elson, Mr. de Kerkhoff uh, and Hans Nielsen, that they have been very important for pushing forward the, the Tampere uh, agenda. And also, uh, 
I was glad to hear from the German delegation that you mentioned Europol because Europol was considered this was the main achievement in the 90s. And that is due to, uh, of course, a highest level, Mr. Cole, but also to the late, late Mr. Krause, or maybe you have known him, uh, would, would share it all. We had uh, five days meetings for, for, for five minutes. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, what is your question? And my question is that <laughs> there, there are some elements uh, that have already been done before, like the mutual evaluation. We had mutual evaluation uh, on terrorism. So that of past, uh, a lot of lessons can be learned of past experiences. And this was your uh, historical note. But thank you, thank you for your comment. Okay, that's more a reflection than a question. So uh, <laughs> if there is any other question which I can take now, but then a question, um, nobody, let's say on this, uh, examples of trust, for example, what, uh, what is trust? Let's say uh, examples of achievements. Is it so clear for citizens what we've been doing for the last 20 years? Yes. Well, my thought's not processed uh, very well yet. Um, that's why I didn't raise my hand. I'm Shannon Fullman from Caritas Europa. I wanted to come back actually to what Sergio was saying in terms of uh, the recent disembarkation agreement with the four countries, because I think your point was uh, really important, and I wasn't here yesterday, so I missed probably the, the backup discussions. Um, but I mean, your criticism, oh, that just got lost. The criticism was that, of course, that's not going to be enough in terms of a sustainable approach of building mutual trust between the member states. Um, but in the interim, is it not a small step forward? Because at least four member states are doing something rather than continuing to, to prevent people from disembarkation. If we could reflect a bit more on that, uh, it'd be interesting to hear also, how we should position ourselves <laughs> when okay. we're toward uh, and trying to... But as a specific example. Mm -hmm. So, trust and disembarkation. I have another question there. Probably I'll take these three at once and then uh, we'll go back to the panel. Hello, uh, Kate Gowans from the UK Permanent Representation. Really interesting uh, day to day. Thank you very much. Um, uh, some real food for thought. Um, just a, a quick question from me. We, we've heard lots about the kind of the digital age and how things have changed and stayed the same since Tampere 20 years ago. In this fast-moving age, how do you think we can ensure that the union remains agile and can take decisions quickly um, so that it can react to these fast-moving situations? I'm thinking of things like the CS reform, uh, but not only that. So how do we ensure that we can move quickly and react? Okay, shall we take it back to the panel and probably start with Irina, if you want, or uh, others uh, on this issue of trust and an example of trust and then the decision making and the, I mean, the need for capacity and fast decision making. Uh, thank you. And the question is very pertinent, but it's very complex. <laughs> um, the reasons we have to analyze very closely, we have to really understand them in order to find solutions for them. But the complexity, in my opinion, comes that it's, it's, a, it's a combination of political, social, economic, even sociological reasons. <laughs> um, the first political is something Thing maybe which we can talk really for hours <laughs> and it's coming from how the European Union is structured, what's the role of each institutions and what the role of political willingness depending on different political choices in different <laughs> member states are bringing to the table. There, of course, now with these elections, uh, you have more fragmented parliament, so you can see <laughs> that the political environment is such that there's a lot of political discussion and different approaches on what the EU is, <laughs> what the level in of integration is and it should be, <laughs> whether we went too fast, for instance, in some of the integra integration issues, um, or too slow, 
for that matter. So there is the political discussion that is adding to the to, to the complexity of, of the the tackling why the, the the what the reasons behind are. But I think there is also two things that add to that. One is how our rules are made. Um, whether there is ownership when there is a legal framework or policy document adopted uh, among everybody. <laughs> and there <laughs> we usually have all these discussions in the council what is a better option to have common lowest denominators, but then you have everybody on board, <laughs> or you have the QMV where certain part in the room feels that something was pushed down their throats. The discussion is out there. Then you have the issues, the 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 the, the issues around different traditions of judicial systems. I I would say we are 28, and we have different histories, and especially that became very very obvious with enlargement. Unfortunately, typically you will have. The issue whether some enlargements in the 2000s happened too fast and whether, you know, we have remnants of those in the form of, you know, of CMVs for two member states, which is not helping in the room when we discuss things. We have a, a system and monitoring, you know, about these things, which obviously is not still resolving the issue. <laughs> um, and then we have a plethora of different mechanisms, I think, that now become I th a little bit in the way of building further trust. We have less conversation and more discussions about technical documents. <laughs> and these things touch about the core of societies, the, 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 in my opinion. Uh, judiciary systems, the effectiveness of them, um, whether the, 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 the arrest warrant where you have a decision with derogations for some member states and not for some others. Or some are covering some historical periods and then it, the system doesn't work a mechanism and then for some others, no, no, no. It's <laughs> there is a lot of emotion when you discuss these things among <laughs> among uh, uh, people. And then, lastly, but not for me very always important, is the fact, do we understand what we are talking about? And there we come to the issues of education, <laughs> of what it means to have uh, an effective system. I, I, I will come back to this negotiation of these famous uh, chapters because at the time when we were negotiating membership, we were always saying, hmm, but there's not much harder key actually, <laughs> you know? So what, what are we then, uh, you know, reforming to? <laughs> and then you would have member states coming over to us and saying, yeah, you copy our system and then this this, this system has to be copy and pasted and we have the best notary system and we have the best enforcement system. And there will be some other member states <laughs> saying, um, we will help you with you know, our practice. And then you realize, no, it, it can't really be cut and pasted. <laughs> Why? Because of you have to enter into understanding each member state system in order to reform it. And I think trust is built only when there is a mutual understanding, discussion, listening to everybody, and trying to find solutions and not just pretending to find solutions. <laughs> It's like in personal relationships, more or less. <laughs> this is like with the member states, you know. <laughs> That's why I say there are psychological reasons as well sometimes. 
And sometimes people can find a solution or sometimes they can't. Well, the discussion, I think, needs to be taken a little bit uh, into that direction. And I, I see a little bit of a, a, a signals there from the president-elect, for instance, of the new European Commission in that direction. So let's see. Uh, that will be mostly for the <laughs> colleague next to me to answer whether they will they would they would kind of uh, feel that there is this change of perhaps a little bit listening in or perhaps a little bit of understanding where somebody is coming from or where the system is coming from uh, criminal civil um, fundamental values um, because the member states come from different histories and sometimes that simply is one of the reasons, and it's not spoken, but it's there. Some sort of response to this question about the speed of decision making. If there is no trust, I mean, and to build trust takes time. I don't know whether Christine wants to add something to this because uh, probably quickly because we don't have that much time left. I, I think Irina put it in, in a way which I, I'm very. Um, uh, in, in admiration, I mean, I think she said a lot of things. No, but I mean, honestly, it's a very difficult question, and I think the way you put it is is, is brilliant, and this is exactly the way we see it. Um, uh, we, we have several examples of situations where it's because of trust it's not happening. We have uh, Schengen enlargement, the, the possibility of having Bulgaria and Romania. They're still under a CVM, so we're still looking at some issues which do matter when you come to lifting internal border control like corruption so still things that we're looking at and which in a way fuel uh, mistrust and there are several examples of this uh, I personally and again uh, please this is really personal uh, view and, and not council secretary I personally don't think we went too fast with enlargement but I think the predicament that uh, you can enlarge and deepen uh, at the same time is, is, is just wrong. I mean, it just doesn't work like this because l'hétérogénéité en français uh, is such that uh, it's very, very difficult to put everybody on the same line, uh, which in a way uh, leads me to comment a little bit about uh, what you said, Sergio, about uh, Schengen. Uh, well, you, of course, remember that Schengen was developed outside the treaty uh, as, a, as a group pionier uh, because developing it within the treaty was, was probably not going to, to work out. So there are a number of uh, issues where you actually need something to happen outside and then you have a club and you have rules and people who want to join the club, they, they're welcome to do so. So uh, it's a model which has worked in the past pretty well and I think there is an element of flexibility in the way we, we develop, which is needed uh, also because of enlargement, but has been always with us. When you go into areas which are deeply rooted in national sovereignties, well then flexibility, uh, agile, being agile is, is really a must. And maybe it's whatever we're seeing now with the uh, Malta thing. I'm, I'm not sure it's much. I'm sh certainly it's very political. Uh, because of the change of government in Italy, so we want to say that, yes, indeed, we, we can do business with, with this country, so that's important. But in a way, uh, if it leads to something which can then be incorporated uh, within the EU framework, uh, I kind of like the idea. So uh, if some countries uh, agree to move ahead, well, by all means, let, let's consider this and, and try to use it to the advantage of the, of the whole. Or, um, Christine, yeah, Christine. Yes. So if I may just add um, to that, and, and the, uh, especially the Malta agreement, um, just to confirm that, I mean, this is, as Christine has just as described it, it's absolutely how we see it. I mean, this is definitely something which is open to others. It's, it's, it's not meant to be exclusive, but this is something where, I think Christine was saying this very nicely, we, we, we're just in a situation where, you, you know, there's something rather pressing which, which just needs a solution and, and if, if, if you want to sort of somehow advance towards a solution then you just have to start somewhere. Uh, and then of course I mean it's definitely not the purity maybe of the community method but then again this is a matter where it goes very much into national sovereignty and um, where we simply have to find a way forward. 
Um, but this is definitely not meant to be exclusive. So this is really meant to be openly marked to others and then maybe somewhere be a little <laughs> stepping stone on, on the way to something bigger. Thank you, Christina. Alexandra, you wanted to add something? Very quickly. Um, just to add two words on the difficult discussion, mutual <laughs> trust, uh, we can have another 20 days seminar and we will not have all the answers after 20, after 20 days, exactly. I mean, very, may, there is a very simple say, but there is a truth in it uh, that says you can easily lo lose trust, but it's very difficult to gain it again. And I think there is really something in it. I mean, if uh, there are incidents happening where people feel that the independence of the judiciary may be somehow in danger, I mean, that may be a perception. But if this happens, I think then we are in a situation that people start questioning this. It's just an example. There may be other things. And I think what we need to do is, I mean, at least to, to, to see how we keep the level of trust. I don't think we need everything harmonized in the European Union. We do not have to harmonize completely criminal law or other things. What is important is, I think, that we have the, the main principles where we can sh say, okay, this is more or less, we are coming from the same principles. The details may be different, um, and, and if we, I think there is something we have to work together, and this is cannot only be the Commission doing it. We have to do this in, in partnership with the Member States, with the European Parliament. I think there is possibly also a need that we all look more into it together, saying what can we do and not acting against each other, but try to find common ground. I think that is what citizens expect. Maybe one last word on the digital age. I think this is one of our biggest challenges. I mean, that we cannot stop the world going forward. And so, okay, we had nice rules uh, 20 years ago. We had maybe nice rules 200 years ago um, and make them, we have to make them fit for our citizens. I think this is our challenge. But I think we can manage that. We don't have every day uh, brilliant ideas, but knowing that uh, our way of life is completely different and what can be done, I mean, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that is a challenge we can address. Quickly, Christine. I meant to say something about digital and, and the way we're developing legislation. We're very slow, and that's normal because of a number of member states and the parliament as well. I'm really looking forward to uh, initiative on technologically neutral legislation. Uh, it's like the, but I mean, really, this goes so fast that you cannot have legislation based on one technology. Uh, it's like Uber, you know, Uber. Uh, to me, it's a cab because you're actually in a cab, right? And it's not because you have it through internet or, or pigeon voyageur or whatever that it ceases to be a cab. So in a sense, uh, we have to, I know the vested interest behind all this, So, but I mean, when you look at it from a, a completely neutral way, well, it's still a cab. So this, um, <laughs> th this attitude to be technologically neutral, I think is probably what we need to be doing if we want our policies to be robust in light of uh, changing technology. With this probably, yeah, Sergio, but very quick. I mean, very short, huh? because otherwise I cut you off. <laughs> I think it's a microphone Hello. for himself. Yes, very short. I think it's central to have very clear what is our travel guide. What is our travel guide and be consistent to that guide. Meaning, if the Treaty of Lisbon, as is supposed to be, is our travel guide, how do we move ahead? The Court of Justice, I think, said it very clearly in the ruling against Hungary and Slovakia on the temporary relocation. Equal solidarity. Member states have to equally share responsibility when it comes to asylum seekers. So pick and choose approach and flexible approach is not permitted in the treaties and the court has served us this in a you know, silver tray. So let's implement that, let's enforce that. Many things have happened actually quite quickly in response to the refugee situation in 2015. The EU has used the treaties, the temporary relocation decisions to in qualified majority voting to respond uh, to that situation. Qualified majority voting, again, it was meant to move from the unanimity rule in these areas, to positively move from that rule, and member states need to comply. We cannot say qualified majority voting, we don't apply. Consensus is qualified majority voting. Again, we are all in the same. Those group. which are sitting in the core pair may have other views on Precisely. that. Precisely, <laughs> and we know, and we know that, and we know, we know how difficult that is, but again, we need to be consistent because if at the moment, we don't enforce and really make sure that the principles are 
clear. Then derailing happens. So, oh, I don't like this. I, you know, I don't apply this. I apply this, I apply that. This is not common policy. So the joint declaration of intent, for me, of course, is very good that those countries say, guys, this is important. But I still believe that this should be done in the EU treaty and policy framework with the European Commission and the European Parliament involved and all countries participating. And we have the means and tools to do that in the EU framework. And the last point on trust, if I may, Carol, the rule of law. The mechanism is very important indeed. How do we implement that mechanism, the rule of law? It's key for trust, and this is very clear. Independent judiciary, fundamental rights protection, civil society freedom, all those issues, which again are the very central for legitimation of EU policies. And I'm very happy that the rule of law is now a priority. SEPs contributed actually quite a lot to this, uh, and the European Parliament also. So this is very good news and it needs to be taken forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. And with these words, um, I'm pleased to close this and certainly to thank the different speakers. Um, thank them for the contribution. I mean, two have already left, but certainly thanks to Irina, to uh, Christine, to uh, Alexandra and Katerina. And also thanks to Sergio for his final words. And certainly also thanks to Malin from the uh, presidency, from the state secretary. And also thanks to Jadis, who's left in the meantime. But also thanks to you all for having listened, for your patience, for your uh, questions. And I hope you have picked up something. Uh, I found it an interesting experience. I've learned a lot. As I said, I'm not a lot into this field, but uh, it has also for me raised many questions. And very soon I will be contacting you on money laundering issues because it's becoming a hot potato. So thank you all. And also thanks to the colleagues from uh, the unit. Thank you.